Can we go this way, guys? My name is Mathieu, and I've been using the, the name Vincent Moon for a few years now to, to show my work, and I mostly make little films about music around the world. I realized, okay, well, if we do it well, if, we, if this project is well made, and it's just no problem, it's, it will be shared for free, and it's not about eating millions on YouTube, actually, it's just about, you know, I just want to make a lot of those films, and if people can see it for free in the, in the easiest way possible. The question about how do people create nowadays, you know? That's, that's the main topic, that's the most beautiful thing. People create in a very, very different way nowadays, you know? It's not about how people see anymore, it's just about, I mean, people still see, but more and more people just do. In, in 1910, you could go through your whole life never once triggering copyright. The only way you triggered copyright was publishing a book or making a public performance of something. These were all activities which normal humans never did. You know, performers did it or writers did it. Move to the present world, every single moment of your day using digital technologies, you are triggering copyright because copyright now gets triggered upon the production of a quote, copy, and there's no way to do anything in the digital world without producing a copy. So a system of federal regulation designed to regulate a tiny slice of culture now, by default, regulates all of culture whenever culture does anything. It's a system designed for an infrastructure of analog technology, applied to an infrastructure of digital technology. And its whole presupposition it makes no sense in the context of digital technology. Our freedom is threatened as we move activities from the physical world to the virtual world because in the virtual world, whatever we do, we do on sufferance. You don't have the right to have a connection to the internet. Your ISP can disconnect you because it wants to. You don't have a right to receive money from anyone on the internet. You can only do that with the help of various companies. So these fundamental activities, to be able to communicate your views to someone, to be able to receive money, to support your activities. These are all precarious once you start doing them in the digital world. I'm Richard Stallman, founder of the free software movement. For us, the values are freedom and community. All users deserve to control their computing and not be under the control of somebody else. In order to have control over the program, users need certain freedoms. And so those freedoms are the criterion for whether a program is free software. Always remember, it's free as in freedom, not as in price. So think of free speech, not free beer. If the users don't have enough freedom to have control over the program, then the program controls the users. And there's always somebody who has control over the program. When I announced this plan in 1983, my goal was simply to make a free operating system so it would be possible to use a computer without ceding your freedom to a non-free program. I realized that you can't have a free software community without a free operating system. So I decided to develop a free operating system for modern computers, a system similar to Unix. Unix was a rather modern system with some technical advances and people admired it and a lot of people used it. So I would make a system compatible with Unix. If you had written a program to run on Unix, it would run on my system also. But my system would consist entirely of free, that is freedom respecting software, so the users of the system would be able to use it in freedom. That was the advance I sought. Not a mere technical advance, but an ethical advance. Richard was a programmer. He then became a philosopher activist. And his real power was not coding, it was 
conceiving. And so he conceptualized a movement that produced people who produced great software, some of which now empowers people to create great culture. The internet is becoming a fundamental piece of infrastructure across all of our lives. Mozilla is a nonprofit organization trying to build a layer of the internet that's really based on the importance of individual people. Mozilla builds very strongly on the free software and open source movements. And of course, Richard Stallman and the Free Software Foundation had been building GNU Linux for, for many years. When we started, we knew we were about freedom and openness and choice and competition on the internet. And we knew that the first step for that was the piece of software called the browser. Then once we had Firefox, uh, I realized it was time to express why we built the browser. And so we ended up with the Mozilla Manifesto. And so that says, first of all, that technology should serve individual human people. Uh, that the internet is a global public resource. Uh, clearly parts of it are commercial, and that's great because it brings a lot of activity, but there's another part of the internet that should be a public resource, accessible to all. That's what we're trying to build. The core of what is internet, the technology of what is internet, compared to the technology of television, is two different ways of approaching the world. They're like almost the opposite. I was really, really interested by the fact that it was sort of like suddenly this kind of like new screen, you know, which was a way for me to really fight against the, the TV language and to uh, develop a language, but develop it in a different way, shared in a different way. I have this wonderful quote from John Philip Sousa where Sousa is testifying about the talking machine, and Sousa says, when I was a boy in front of every house in the summer evenings, you'd find young people together singing the songs of the day or old songs. We'll not have a vocal cord left. The vocal cords will be eliminated by a process of evolution, as was the tale of man when he came from the ape. Here's a musician, a professional musician, who's celebrating amateur musicians, celebrating amateur culture, and his fear is technology is gonna take this away that we are going to become a culture that just sits there listening and not singing, consuming and not producing. Uh, and of course, that's who we became in the 20th century. We became this culture that was obsessed with super high production value music. And you know, it was quaint or kind of traditional to think about people sitting down at the piano or picking up their guitar. That's, that's not what we did. We consumed. Technology drove us to that. But um, the 21st century has revived Sousa's conception of culture, because now like a 21st century type of technology invites all sorts of people to participate in the creation and the recreation of their culture. We become read-write creators as opposed to read-only creators. We developers can only make a new idea useful by combining it with the things you know. Also wir müssen unbedingt hier äh, also Neues mit Bekannten kombinieren, um nützlich zu sein. And that's what patents don't allow us to do. We must escape software patents. Das ist das, was Patente uns äh, ver verbieten. Und deshalb müssen wir davon freikommen, von diesen, von diesen Softwarepatenten. An ethical society respects people's freedom. It's organized so people have freedom. But with non-free software, the users don't have freedom. They're under the control of someone else. The idea of free software came to me from seeing it in life at MIT. And at first, I applied it only to software. But in the 90s, as I gave speeches about free software, people started asking me to what extent these ideas apply to other things. I was a big believer in Richard Stallman's framing of this issue as an issue of freedom. And that's why I called what I did free culture, because it is an issue of freedom. And so we stole everything we, we got from free software. I mean, you know, everything. Is free. So we sat down and we said, how do we hack the free software movement and turn it into a free culture movement? And we said to the world, you know, experiment. Yeah, this morning we went to the island of uh, Kolk, which is like an hour away from Rijeka in Croatia. We went there because I was really interested in recording their singings at the church. This is then Glagolitic singing, which goes back to the medieval times. And it's the last place in Croatia and probably the last village actually where you can see that. So that's going to make a nice little film. In the late 90s, 
we had the development of a technology that encouraged people to create and share their creativity uh, in ways that had been unimaginable. So what we thought was, okay, most of America thinks that the world's divided between those who believe in copyright the way Hollywood does and those who are pirates who don't believe in copyright. And we believe that there's actually more than just this simple binary out there. We think that there are people who believe in copyright but also believe that they want to create and share their work and they want others to share their work. So let's give them a simple way to say freedom. And let's just see whether there are 10 or 100 or 1,000 or a million or a half a billion people out there who want to say, yeah, I want my work to be shared and built upon. And so we built these simple licenses that get attached to creative work, that travel with the work, that enables people to say, you're free to build upon this. That was the genesis of what we thought Creative Commons was about. And I think the whole Creative Commons, uh, uh, you know, license fits very well with the, the way the world evolves. And it gives just like power to the creator again, you know? Just how many bands there is nowadays compared to like 10 years ago? How many filmmakers there is compared to 10 years ago? It's, this is amazing. That's, that would tell a lot more about what is our society made of nowadays. It's a movement that began with artists who had a freedom to choose. They could choose to make their work freely available or choose to opt into the exclusive world. And, and the artists who inspired were those who said that I, I built upon the work of others and I want others to be able to build upon my work too. So I decided to, 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 to share all my work with a uh, Creative Commons license by NCSA, you know. For me it fits very well with my way of working. I don't really believe at all in selling any, anything. I don't make my films against money, but I, actually I, I, I am paid in another way. People invite me here or there, people help me to make other films and, and then people share energies and that's, that's much more precious than just like selling my, my stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah, love it, love it. <laughs> I can come back later. Okay? <laughs> I began to look deeper into the tradition of, you know, law about intellectual property in the United States and recognized that the law had always been striking a balance between free and proprietary. Balance was essential to a culture where new ideas got created and shared and built upon. But what was increasingly the dominant rhetoric was the rhetoric of proprietize everything. Um, and that was the way to create real value and real creativity. And that just seemed to me wrong, historically wrong. And just at the moment when culture could be uh, democratized, the law was, was asserting itself most vigorously. So it seemed to me this was exactly the moment to try to wake this movement up. There is the desire to establish a free world, to liberate cyberspace. For me and for many others, that's an important motive. Free software is useful knowledge embodied in a usable form, which is available to all of society. And the core of the internet is open source free software. The core of the protocols are you do what you want, I don't control you. That's why the system is so successful. And that's why it's become the fabric of our life. And, you know, 20 years is because it's open. So, so the social value and the economic value created out of the internet are huge. This is not an economy where there won't be great wealth made. The question is whether great wealth will be made by controlling people's ability to create or by empowering people to create. Um, uh, and so the lesson of history is that we've always produced more value where you empower people to create as opposed to where you silence people. That's the insight that we have to figure out how to build the business models around. And our mistake in the past 15 years has been handing over policy making to people whose business model was all about controlling. Right? The difference between NBC and YouTube was that NBC was in the business of figuring out how do I architect an audience and YouTube was in the business of thinking about how do I encourage an audience to start making videos of their cats and sharing them with you know, a million other people, right? That's a fundamentally different insight. Both of them are profitable businesses, but one of them is a profitable business that's profitable because it empowers people to create as opposed to another which is profitable because it, it, it teaches people to shut up and listen.
I don't know why people shy away from making statements of values, but our society seems to condemn that. Partly, I think, because of the influence of business. Real persons, if they do something that's lawful but nasty, you'll say, you're a jerk. You're acting like a jerk. Stop it. But we're not supposed to ever say that to corporations who are supposed to say, oh, well, it's lawful, so we just have to suffer it. The ability to envision something different and to build a technology that enables something different, I think, is our key value. Because without that, we would have built a browser and been done, but not trying to enable people to do things. We made this film, An Island, with this band, After Klang. Kind of like longer project, a bit more ambitious. And so we went to Denmark for three days. Came the time to, to release it, you know, and, and so as usual, I'm like, uh, hey guys, just like, let's put this on the internet. And they're like, yeah, but you can find a sort of like a way to, uh, don't you think about film festivals? I'm like, no, 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 no. So then they came up with this amazing idea. It was like, okay, so why don't we do this thing? If you want to see it, you cannot really just see it on the internet. You have to subscribe to, to the website and actually just simply organize a screening of it. But it can be at your home, it can be at your favorite cafe, it can be in the street. If you do it like that, so we send you the film, the only rule is that we will announce it on the website. Let's say in Paris on that day, there's going to be a screening of an island, and it's not going to be in this or that cinema. It might be just at the home of that person, but people will know about it. It's free for them to, to come, and you have to let the door open, you know? So it was such an amazing way for us to basically say, oh, I want you to enjoy this film in the same way that we've been making it. I want people to gather, in that sense of like trying to get people together, musicians and non-musicians, and, and we all have this beautiful moment together. So people come by and like, hey, hello, sorry, I don't know you, but I, but I brought a pie. And, oh, I brought a bottle. <laughs> Let's have a good time. We use this, the, this film as a way to, to bring people together. But the goal is not the film itself. The goal is like all the repercussions and all the things around, right? At Mozilla, we view everyone as community. We have some who are employees and some who are volunteers, but we're all trying to build a world of opportunity and empowerment. I see what you know creators like Vincent are doing as demonstrating the way in which free culture can be produced and shared. So it's about the filmmaker sitting down and saying, what would free mean for us? But we need the same thing in education and science and music and photography. You know, all of these spaces have got to engage the same question and come up with the same kind of answer. You will find people who profess a simplistic theory of human nature. Humans do things when they're paid. Well, they don't know much about humans. If you write a useful free program, a lot of people will appreciate your work. It feels good. Hopefully that's the, that's the good balance I'm trying to find is by sharing all those films for, for free like that. You know? yeah. Do whatever you want with those. It's not really my films at some point. It's just ours. <laughs>